On to rule eight, the serve. Every rally begins with the action of a serve. There are three basic types of serves that most players use, and you can see them illustrated by the graphic. There are underhand serves and overhand serves and jump serves, but there are still others outside of this short list, and even within these three types, there is lots of variation on technique and style. The rules don't name the types of serves. Instead, these are the product of the creativity and of players and coaches over decades of volleyball evolution. The rules just provide some basic requirements, and as long as the actions of the players meet those requirements, the serve is legal. Let's talk about the rules surrounding the actions of the serve. Article one of this rule describes those very basic requirements that must be true of any serve. The server must contact the ball with one fist, hand, or arm, either while the ball is in the air or while it's being held, and the server has five seconds to complete the action from the time the referee authorizes the serve. That's it. Article two describes where the serve is allowed to occur, which is known as the service zone. It's important to note that the player cannot touch the end line, nor may the player be in the area outside the service hash marks when they contact the ball. So here we can see that the end line is not considered part of the service zone, which is shown in green, but the hash marks are a part of the service zone. A player could have their foot contacting the hash marks at the moment they contact the ball, and that would be okay as long as no part of their foot went outside the hash marks. However, no part of the foot may contact the end line. A player is also allowed to begin their serve from outside the service zone as long as their last contact with the floor before hitting the ball comes from within the service zone. So we see a lot of players who like to start out here and then kind of swoop their way in and jump from right there, and that's fine. I'm going to pair up articles three and five, where we are introduced to the words term of service. The rules outline two types of terms of service, that for a team and that for a player. Remember that the six positions on the floor are known as the service order. If player number four is first in the service order, then the term of service for the team starts when that player rotates to right back and ends whenever that team has a loss of rally. Contrast that with a player's term of service. Once player number four assumes the right back position, the team's term of service has begun and so has the player's term of service. In the image, you can see that the team's term of service is in green while the player's term of service is in orange. If player number four is substituted out of the set, then the player's term of service ends, but the team's term of service continues with whomever substitutes into that position. Let's say player number three substitutes in. Then it will be player number three's term of service as the team's term of service continues. Why is this distinction important? Well, the rule alludes to something called a reserve, which is actually defined in the next article, and says that each player can have a reserve during a team's term of service. So if player number four uses a reserve, let's say back here, and then gets substituted out for player number three, then player number three now gets their own reserve as well. If player number four comes back into the set for player number three, then player number four does not get another reserve because they've already used their reserve in their previous term of service, which is still in the same team's term of service. That hasn't ended yet. It's not until the team has a loss of rally that both the players and the team's term of service ends. If number four should take another reserve in their second attempt or their second uh, term of service within the same team term of service, then that would end in a loss of rally as well. Okay, let's back up to article number four, which talks about the possibility of a team playing with fewer than six players. Remember, a team needs six players to begin the match, but once the match is underway, a team may play with fewer than six players if one or more players becomes injured, ill, or disqualified, and there are no legal or exceptional substitutes available. This is definitely a rare case, 
but in the event that it happens, we have to know how to handle it. Let's say player number five gets injured and is removed from the match. There's now a vacancy in the service order where player number five was. This vacancy rotates around the court. So while the vacancy is in the front row, there are only two front row players. When the vacancy rotates to the back row, the referee signals a loss of rally due to an improper or illegal server. As referees, we need to be aware of where the vacancy is on the floor at all times, not just when it rotates back to the service position. It might help to tell yourself something like the ghost player follows number seven, or remind yourself of the position of the ghost player at the beginning of each rally. Ghost is in left front, ghost is in center front, ghost is in right front, and so on. The last article of Rule 8.1 defines the reserve. A player is allowed to toss the ball and either catch it or let it drop to the floor, once per team term of service. If that happens, we issue a reserve to the player and let them try again. The signal we use is the same as the replay signal, but the terms reserve and replay are not interchangeable. When a reserve is issued by the referee, it must immediately be followed by the next beckon for serve. There can't be any requests made by either team until the rally is completed. These articles of Rule 8.2 describe the flow of the match from the perspective of the serve. The player in the right back is the server. They serve until the team has a loss of rally or until the end of the set. Serve alternates sides at every loss of rally, and the teams alternate who gets first serve in each set. If we take a deciding set, there's usually a coin toss to determine who gets the first serve. Although some of our EOA customers might have adopted a different rule, be sure that you know the format for the match you're working before you get there. Article 5 basically says that not abiding by all the stuff we said before constitutes an illegal serve. The rulebook identifies which signal to use in each situation. The one I'll point out is letter E. We usually give the benefit of the doubt to a player who serves before the referee's whistle. They're often embarrassed or apologetic when they realize their mistake. If you've got a server that deliberately serves before your signal, then you're probably looking at a conduct issue, especially if it puts somebody else in danger. The appropriate action in that case is probably either going to be a verbal warning or a card. Article six defines the term service fault. This is not the same as an illegal serve, which was defined in the previous article. We might think of a service fault as just a bad serve. The ball doesn't cross the net, or the serve goes out of bounds, or the serve hits the antenna, things like that. The possible signals for a service fault are a net serve signal or an out signal. I tend to see newer officials use an in signal for the case where maybe the ball doesn't quite make it to the net and lands in on the serving team's side, but that should actually be a net serve signal. I also see some officials use an out signal for if the ball lands out of bounds on the serving team's side, like maybe near the ref stand or near the pole. That should also be a net serve signal. Basically any ball that lands on the floor, inside the court or outside the court, on the serving team side should be signaled as a net serve. So why did we spend the last two slides nitpicking the difference between an illegal serve and a service fault? Well, in the event that both the serving team and the receiving team screw up at nearly the same time, we have a protocol for how to determine who gets penalized. I've represented the two scenarios that are outlined in the Rule 8.2 penalties in this chart. First, imagine that the serving team commits an illegal serve and the receiving team is out of alignment. The receiving team can't be penalized for their alignment fault until the serve is legally contacted. Because the serving team never put the ball into play through a legal serve, the serving team is the one that gets penalized point goes to the receiving team. In the second scenario, imagine this time that the serving team commits a service fault and the receiving team is once again out of alignment. 
Since the serving team legally put the ball into play, the receiving team now gets penalized for their alignment fault. The alignment fault gets penalized because the receiving team was out of alignment at the moment that that ball was legally contacted by the server, whereas the serving team's fault didn't occur until the ball went where it wasn't supposed to go. So the, the result is point goes to the serving team. So what's not in this rule? Well, this rule doesn't seem to cover what to do when an illegal server is discovered. What do we do when a player who is legally on the floor serves out of order? Look under the rule six penalties for what to do if that happens. I don't know why the penalties are listed in rule six, y'all just go with it. There is, however, a situation in the casebook under Rule 825 that is worth reading. Let's talk about the possibilities and bring back those charts from earlier. First of all, let's say that player number four is supposed to be the correct server, but player number nine goes back to serve. If someone catches it, hopefully an attentive scorer or the R1 or the R2 or all of the above, before the end of the play, then the result is a loss of rally and point to the receiving team. It's a fault just like any other fault, and you caught it when you should have, so good job. Next, let's consider what happens if that sneaky number nine serves and continues serving undetected. First, let's say number nine earns a point, then goes back to serve again and earns a second point, and then is going back to serve a third time or maybe actually serves the ball when someone finally recognizes that, hey, that's the wrong server. Since the wrong server earned two points, we are going to cancel the two points that number nine earned and then award a loss of rally and point to the receiving team. But what happens if the legal server, number four, goes back to serve, earns a point, and then the illegal server, number nine, comes after them and scores a point as well undetected? Let's say number nine goes back to serve a third time when we realize, hey, number nine shouldn't be serving. What do we do then? Well, rule 6-4, the penalties, state that all points earned by an improper server shall be canceled. So here, we're going to cancel the point that number nine earned, but the point that the legal server, number four earned, will be retained. Finally, there's the scenario from the casebook under rule 825. What if number nine, the wrong server, serves for one point, then the coach recognizes that, hey, that's the wrong server, and they send the correct server back to serve, who also earns a point. And when that legal server goes back to serve again, we realize, hey, we had a wrong server the first time through. What do we do? Well, the logic here is that number four's legal serve never would have happened if we had caught the illegal server, number nine. In this case, we cancel both the points earned by number nine and the point earned by number four. And a loss of rally goes to the receiving team. So to paraphrase, once the illegal server is discovered, we cancel all points earned after that illegal server contacted the ball. Remember, points can be canceled up until the time when the next team contacts their first serve. Okay. You didn't know a rule as simple as the serve could be quite so complicated, did you? I hope the diagrams make some sense, but if they don't, please make sure you're writing down questions to send to your mentor. Comb through those scenarios in the casebook as well. Oh, and I can tell you that I took my VHSL rules exam today, and at least four of the questions on my exam came directly from this presentation. So I'm glad to say I think we're doing something right. Okay, that's all I've got for you here. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in another video.